That was wonderful. I, I don't know, know if I want to listen to myself twice now. Oh, but you'll get fed. She means the, the dinner at the night service tonight. Um, we'll do some different things at night in this uh, quarter. We'll let you know about those in advance. But yeah, this week as we begin, um, same message morning and night. Uh, I'm Jeff. Good morning. And um, we are in week three today of launching the Transformation Trek. We are, are, are doing this because we want to introduce every month or so this year a new practice, something practical that we can do that will help us to follow Jesus, to become more like him. Because one of our focuses this year, um, as we get into 2024, well into it now, is that we as a church and we as individuals want to relentlessly pursue Jesus to continually to keep chasing after him and becoming one with him, one in our thinking, in our actions, in our whole lives. And, and we believe that this year will be a big change. This will be a big transformation. This will mark a, a big um, boost in our, yours and my, growing relationship with Jesus. Now, the first um, practice that Laura unpacked for us, the first stop or pause or marker on the transformation trek is abide. This is the first practice that we want to abide in Jesus. How do we stay with him? And how do we align our discipleship with him rather than with other things in the world? In John chapter 15, Jesus said, if we abide in him, then he abides in us and we become his disciples and we bear much fruit. Now, disciple and discipleship, which Jesus talks about and we're talking about, they're Bible words, but the, the best um, parallel for us today is apprentice and apprenticeship because it's the same kind of idea. Jesus had 12 apprentices. They're called disciples or apostles in the Bible, but they were his apprentices. They did their apprenticeship with him. They followed him. They lived with him. They learned from him. They became like him. They abided in him. And that's how they grew as apprentices. And, and that's what we want to do. That's what we want to do even now that we can't physically walk with him in a spiritual sense and with the focus and direction of our lives. We want to be apprentices of Jesus. So how do we make sure that our apprenticeship is actually to him rather than to anyone else or anything else? Because the reality is that every single one of us, every single person in the whole world is already an apprentice or a disciple of someone or of something. We all are. The world around us and the things that we choose to do already shape us. They already disciple and apprentice us in some way. So you watch a YouTube video, pick any, any YouTube video, what you're doing when you watch that video, you're allowing it to apprentice you or disciple you in some way. You listen to a podcast and you're allowing that podcast to disciple you. If you go to the gym, then you're allowing that physical space and the people that are in that space to disciple you and your life in some way. Even, even by yourself, if you choose to discipline yourself and you do stretches or exercises in the morning at home, you are letting that, choosing to let that practice disciple you in some way. You spend time with people and you're allowing them to disciple you. If you lie on your tax return. If you gossip about a friend, if you look at pornography, if you read a book, if you play a game, if you do your homework, if you don't do your homework, if you listen to music, any kind of music, good, bad, everything in between, we are all disciples and apprentices of people and ideas and systems. We all are. Every single person in the world is already a disciple. The difference is, the difference is if you're a Christian, you get to choose to make your apprenticeship to Jesus rather than to anyone else or anything else. So, so let me ask you today, are you already intentionally doing your apprenticeship with Jesus? 
If you've already decided he's the most important person who ever lived, if, if you've already decided he is your savior and your God, then this practice of abiding is how you make sure that your apprenticeship is aligned to him rather than to anyone else or anything else. So Jesus said it like this in, in John 15 verse five. He said, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. So those who remain in me or those who abide in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He's, he's using a metaphor. Jesus is using a metaphor to explain how our relationship with him works or how it needs to be. That remaining, that abiding, that staying connected to him is, is so important because if we're not connected to him, if we're a branch that's cut off from the vine, then, then we can't produce fruits. We can't really do anything of eternal value if we're cut off from the vine. So the key is, the key is, and, and, and this is an instruction he gives, which means it's a choice we get to make whether we want to stay connected to the vine, to abide in him. And, and he says, if we do, he will stay connected to us and will bear much fruit. You know, the fruit that, that his spirit brings, love and joy and peace and so on, will come out of our life. And the work that God has called you to in the world, representing him, introducing other people to him, bringing hope, bringing healing to the world, that's what will happen if we abide in him. But we often need help. We often need practical help. Now we talked last week about the, the role of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' ongoing presence in the world. But today we're gonna talk about something much more practical with some help that we need. Now in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, one um, on stage portrayal on the screen behind me, Romeo visits Juliet one night and she is in her room up high in the building and looking out wistfully into the night and he is down below in the garden and he climbs up to her window. It's a little bit stalkerish, um, but I think she invites him to. Um, and and he, he climbs up to her window, up the wall of this garden or of her house, but he's not Spider-Man. How does... Romeo climb up the wall, he climbs up because there's a trellis along the wall so that the garden, the, the plants in the garden can grow up. That's how he climbs up. He doesn't just climb up a, a bare wall, he climbs up the trellis, the wooden structure that's built against the wall for the purpose of the garden growing up. And so in, in one version of the play, Juliet is standing at the, at the window looking out into the night and she says, oh, oh Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? And, and his strained voice comes floating up from down below. I'm in the garden. The trellis broke. <laughs> Without a trellis, Romeo isn't climbing the wall. Without a trellis in a garden, vines aren't growing up. That's how Juliet's wall worked. That's how gardens work. It's how vineyards work. And it's also how Jesus' analogy works, that we need some intentional trellis in our life so that we can grow up into Jesus. Without a trellis in your life, without intentional structure in your life, you won't be able to grow up into Jesus. But like we've talked about, you already have a trellis. Your life already has trellis in it that you have built. Now, you might have done that on purpose or it might have just happened accidentally by your choices, but your life already has structure designed to already receive and abide in someone or some people or something or, or some things. They're, they're the actions, the habits, the, the culture, the practices, the customs that you have. Everything about your life is already structured to receive, to be discipled by people and by things. But what we're talking about today is that you, as a follower of Jesus, have the freedom to choose to set your trellis up so that you are receiving from Jesus, so that you're apprenticing yourself to him. Now, the apostle Paul, he described it like this, this, this change in Romans chapter 6, verse 20. He said, when you were slaves to sin, you were, sorry, yeah, when you, were, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. 
And what was the result of that? You are now ashamed of the things that you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now, he says, now you're free from the power of sin and instead have become slaves to God or slaves of God. And now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. The trellis of your life, it used to lead to things that now make you ashamed or, or embarrassed, things that didn't lead to any good eternal value and, and maybe in some cases led to eternal doom. But when you committed yourself to Jesus, he set you free. He set you free from the power of sin. And so now you can choose to do other things. You can choose to set your life up in another way. You have that freedom now to do things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. So let me give you just a, a really simple basic example is, is that coming to church regularly is a trellis in your life that you can choose to put in place. That if you make a commitment to be as church as, as often as you can, it will not magically make you more like Jesus. Coming to a church service doesn't automatically make you a, a great apprentice of Jesus, but it's a trellis of commitment that puts you in the right kind of environment to help you grow up and become like Jesus. Now, instead, if you decide, I, I don't need to go to church, maybe occasionally I'll go to church, but I'm already a Christian. I have the Holy Spirit within me. I'm already following Jesus. I don't need to go to church, so, so I won't. You, you are correct. You don't have to. But what are you going to replace that with? What will you replace church with? And, and ask yourself, does, does fishing or, or staying at home to do your nails or going to work help you abide in Jesus more than coming to church does? Everything you do, everything you do in your life is a trellis that allows you to apprentice yourself to someone or something. So how can you make decisions that set up your life to abide in Jesus? That's what we're talking about. And today I want to introduce you to a tool that's super practical to help you do this. It's called a rule of life. A rule of life is something that you create with, with God's help and His inspiration. And it's a guide for your life that will have boundaries and will have habits and will have rhythms that are designed by you with God's help that will help you apprentice yourself more closely to Jesus than to anyone else or anything else. I did not come up with it. A rule of life is a really old idea. In the sixth, si ah, every time I practice this, sixth century is very difficult to say. Way back in the sixth century, Saint Benedict said this about a rule of life. He said it's a framework for freedom. Remember the freedom that Jesus gives us? Freedom from sin so that we can be slaves of God. A rule of life is a framework for freedom. So don't think of it like a commandment or, or like rules. You know, alarm bells could well be going off in your, your head. That's not what this is about. It's a rule of life like a ruler, which is a measurement. A rule of life is a way to measure the things that I'm going to take on in my life, the things I'm going to do with my time and my energy and my attention. It's a way to help me relentlessly pursue Jesus and abide in Him. And so as you try this tool out, this rule of life tool that I'll introduce you to today, the aim is that it helps you put yourself in a position where you can be a closer apprentice of Jesus rather than other people or, or other things in your life. But remember, it's, it's not about rules. It's not that kind of rules of life. A rule of life is not about poor attempts to please God. It's about practice, having a go, not about performance and trying to reach something, not about effort, not about earning. It's just a way of stewarding your time and your energy and your life as worship in response to who Jesus is and what he's already done for you. 
One more um, quote about what a rule of life is. Um, Henry Nouwen, the author, said this. He said, a, a rule offers creative boundaries within which God's loving presence can be recognized and celebrated. It does not prescribe, but it invites. It does not force, but it guides. It does not threaten, but warns. It does not rigidly confine, but it keeps you moving in the right direction. So I've started working on my rule of life for this year. It's something that I've, I've done before lots of times, and so the, the changes that I'm making aren't as big or as drastic as you might find yourself making, because this isn't a new idea to me. But as the year began, I set some time aside to think and to pray about the various areas or categories of my life. And, and all of this will, will provide for you. Um, but some of the categories that, that I thought about are about you know, my, my spiritual life, my abiding in Jesus. What am I actually doing to, to help that? I'm thinking about my relationships and my family, thinking about my work and about my finances, thinking about my church family, thinking about how I'm hospitable to others, how I'm loving others. I'm thinking about my health and my well-being. I'm thinking about my digital discipleship. How, how are my devices and what I'm doing with those devices or looking at or watching or reading, how is that discipling me? And I'm thinking about creativity and building. What do I want to produce with my life? Now on the screen will be um, just a, a small example of a spreadsheet there, just three of those life categories on the left in green. And then across the top, how often I want to try and do those things or how often I want to be reminded of those things. So is it an everyday thing? Is it weekly or fortnightly? Is it monthly or is it quarterly or yearly? And this isn't going to go on forever, but, but charting out for this year. Now, I'll, I'll explain to you that one in the top left, the one about the sales, because I've got a bit of a story about that. But you can see there's some of the other things, some of them I've already been doing in my life, but I want to actually capture it and say, no, this is what I intentionally want to do. This will help me apprentice myself to Jesus. Some of the other things are, are new things to go, I haven't been doing this, but I think this will really make a difference. I want to start doing this. But, but like you, I don't have endless time and, and energy, so I don't just want to come up with a rule of life that's just adding all these things that I'm going to try and cram into the zero time that I have left. My rule of life also needs to be a stop doing list. To go, hey, I've been spending a lot of time doing this, but, but I realize this actually isn't helping me be an apprentice of Jesus. So I actually want to stop doing this or I, I want to do less of this. Um, St Steve Gray, who is the pastor who came up with the Transformation Trek idea, um, I'll, I'm going to give you in a moment his example of the whole rule of life. He talks about he wants to downgrade his phone this year and he's done that. So no more smartphone for him. He's got a dumb phone now that's very difficult to text with. Um, but you can still make calls, but it's his way in digital discipleship of limiting himself because he was just spending too much time being discipled online in ways that weren't helpful for him. So then you start filling out these things. Now, some of you, even though I've been, been talking about um, stories and about my life, some of you fell asleep as soon as that spreadsheet went on the screen because spreadsheets are like the worst kind of sheet, followed closely by fitted sheets because they're just impossible to fold. So remember, a spreadsheet is, is just a tool. It's just one example. You could do something else. You know, you might come up with some other way to capture the ideas of a rule of life that just help you focus and help you be an apprentice of Jesus. Now, um, on the screen now will be a, a QR code and a link. And just a, a little aside about QR codes. Every time we put one up on the screen, we also try and put a link there too. So like the giving slide before, for example. Um, same here. If you can't do QR codes or you just, your phone won't focus, you can always tap the link in. This will give you the whole entire guide, a full example and a full um, downloadable PDF or Word doc as well you can use there. While you're doing that, let me tell you um, about that one about the sales that I had in, in a, a daily abiding with Jesus. Um, last year, I had a, a few sessions with a leadership coach. 
And one of the things that she really helped me realize was that there's, I was out of balance in, in how much I was trying to produce for God, how much I was trying to do for God, and how much I was trying to be successful for God. And, and she just said, you know, I, I realized it wasn't working, that it was really frustrating me and stressing me out. And we talked about the idea that it, that it doesn't all depend on me, that what God wants to do, a lot of it depends on Him. And so we talked about the idea of sailing. When you're sailing a boat, you have zero control of how strong the wind is. And you have zero control of which direction the wind is coming from. But when you're sailing the boat, you can choose whether you put the sails up or not, and you can choose how you trim them and arrange them in order to try and catch the wind and go somewhere with the boat. And so as we, we talked about this idea and wrestled through it, I came up with this idea and, and just, you know, this, this one little phrase that in my life and in my ministry, as I, as I help lead our church, I need to put the sails up every day in case the wind blows. I need to put the sails up every day in case the wind blows. I put that on the spreadsheet, but if, if spreadsheets put you to sleep, here's what else I did. I changed the lock screen on my phone to a picture of a sailing boat. And I just used Canva and I put, some, some, put those words over the picture, just you know, small on the side, put the sails up every day in case the wind blows, so that every time I, I open my phone, every time I pick my phone up, I'm being reminded that this is part of the, the rule, the measure, the boundary, the reminder that I need in my life. And, and it's a visual one. I didn't even need a spreadsheet for it. So use the tool, but you might come up with keywords, you might come up with a poem, you might, you might draw something or capture some pictures, you might use music, but whatever it is, use things that become your rule, your guide to help you apprentice yourself to Jesus. And, and just practice, have a go. As you start to write things down or, or sketch some pictures, start to live it out and, and have a go for a couple of weeks or a couple of months and just see how it feels. Is, is it working? Is it helping me follow Jesus? Or, or is it really a, a burden or is it life-giving? And then after a month or so, you might wanna have some time to, to share this with your small group, with your best friend and just say, hey, here's some of the things I've been trying to do and, and work it out and then say, all right, this is it now. This is my rule of life for three months or for a year at the most. And then just say, now I'm just gonna give it a go and see what God can do with my life with this added intentionality. Now you could do this entirely by yourself and just check in with a friend or, or with your small group, or you might wanna create this together with your spouse or with your family with your small group or with your group of friends because a rule of life individually is really helpful, but, but if we do it together with others, it can be even more powerful. Now, before we finish today, I need to deal with two problems about the rule of life, and, and this ties into to my picture of the sailing boat. That anytime we do this, anytime we try and take some ownership for our spiritual growth, we come across two problems, two extremes. The first is that we think it's all about me. If I don't abide, if I don't stay connected, if I don't work hard at this, then, then, then God will be disappointed in me or, or my life will, will be wasted or, or, or am I even really saved? Have I really received that freedom if I can't even sort my, my own life out? And it's really important that we remember that it's not all about us. It's primarily about Jesus and what he's already done for us. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul the Apostle wrote, My old self has been crucified with Christ, so it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And so I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When, when we are tempted to think that it's all about me, We've got to remember that Jesus has already done the work of connecting me to him. He's making it possible for me to abide in him and to be in right relationship with him. So I can't fall into, I don't need to fall into that trap of thinking it's all about me and what I do because life is a partnership with Jesus where he's already done 
the most important work. Now, the second problem that we can have with this idea of a rule of life is, is I think that it's not about me at all. Whatever happens, happens. It's, it's out of my control. Like, if I abide or not, that's, that's God's problem, not me. That's up to Him. If I'm stuck in a bad habit, well, well too bad. If I sin, well, oh well, that's God's problem because everything is out of my control and I can't do anything. But, but we have to remember that our choices and our responses are largely within our control. And so in Romans chapter 6, in verse 12, it says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, by your choice and your action, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. This is the difference that Jesus makes. He has broken the power of sin. He, he, hasn't, he hasn't broken the existence of sin. He's broken the power of sin over your life and he shares his power with you so that you're free to make decisions that'll help you move away from sin and towards abiding in him. So you get to choose each day how you will live and what you will do and, and what you'll spend your time on. You get to choose who or what you will be an apprentice to. You participate in your fruitfulness and your transformation. So on any day you find yourself leaning one way or the other, you're going to find different parts of the New Testament seem to agree with you. Because they, as they followed Jesus, were wrestling with these same things. Is, is, is it just all rest on me and my responsibility? Is it, is it all rest on God and I have no part in it? But, but the overarching message that, that each of the followers of Jesus and Jesus himself came back to is that there's this partnership that Jesus has done, what only he can do, so that you can do what only you can do. Jesus has already done what only he can do so that now you can do what only you can do. He can't make you. No one else can make you. You're the only one who can. But you can't die on the cross for your own sins. Only he could, and he did. So Jesus has done what only he can do, so that now you can do what only you can do. Let me finish with a story about a pineapple. Unfortunately, it's not a pineapple house under the sea for SpongeBob SquarePants, but it's a pineapple in my backyard. I looked out the window the other day and I saw this pineapple that was growing and getting close to being ripe, but not yet. But it was bent over, the stalk was bent over and it was almost laying on the ground. And there was a, a piece of wood lying next to the pineapple. And I thought, oh, someone else has already tried to put a trellis in place to secure this pineapple to help it grow up. And, and I, I actually haven't quizzed my family about this. I'm sure they did it with the best of intentions and, and it probably served that pineapple well for, you know, a couple of weeks or something. But, but here it was lying on the ground because it just wasn't the right kind of trellis for the pineapple as big as it had grown in this stage in its life. Now a new trellis was needed for this pineapple. And as you think about your life and you think about a rule of life, there might be things that you are doing that served you well in the past, but now it's time for something new. It's time for a new trellis. If you really want to abide in Jesus today, it's time to let go of the old and embrace the new. So I found a big piece of wood in my shed, something from a pallet. I got the saw out and I, I cut an angle off one end so it would be sharp enough to, to go into the ground and I went out there with a hammer and I just pounded that trellis into the ground next to the pineapple. And then I just found a big old dirty piece of rope and just tied the stalk of the pineapple to that trellis. Now it looks weird from the outside, but I don't care. <laughs> because in a few days time, we're gonna get to eat that good fruit. And the things that you place in your life might look weird from the outside. The things that you choose to do or to not do might seem strange to other people, but you should not care if it helps you abide in Jesus. No trellis, 
no pineapple for us. No rule of life in some way, shape, or form will mean no real discipleship to Jesus. It's time to take your faith more seriously and develop a rule of life to align your discipleship to Jesus rather than to the world. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have already done what only you can do. And, and you actually keep doing that because you promised when we abide in you, you, you'll abide in us. You continue to do what only you can do. And that enables us to do what only we can do. So God, I pray that today and this week, as, as we grab hold of this idea of a rule of life, that it would be life-giving to us and to our relationship with you. I pray that it would lead us to freedom from sin in the way that we've been reading and talking about. I pray that it would give us a greater experience of our relationship with you and of your presence. And I pray that it would lead to more good fruit from our lives for your sake. Would you help us as we get really practical and think about this? Help us with ideas and inspiration. Help this be something that we do with you rather than just attempting for you. I ask in your name. Amen. As the music team joins me on stage, remember you can grab that guide now. And we also have a bunch of printed copies at the info desk. You can grab after the service in just a moment. We, next week are going to move on to a new series because the transformation track kind of pops up every month or two with a new practice. So that means next week we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew and we're going to invite you to read the Gospel of Matthew with us as we prepare for and, and lead up to Easter. So that we'll introduce that next Sunday. But we won't forget about the rule of life. So as you implement it this week and talk about it with your small group and with your family, we'll come back to it in the weeks to come and talk about it on Sundays. Um, and so grab that either from the info desk or online. But it all starts here. The transformation trek starts here. It's up to you. You can choose whether you want to practice abiding using this tool or not. But I encourage you to take time this week with Jesus to, to work on your rule of life. Thanks, Matt and the team.